All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome back Dr. Alexander Evans. Uh, Alex is an expert on the surgical anatomy of the skull base for the second installation in his series on neurosurgical anatomy. Dr. Evans and his colleagues spearhead the development of new operative techniques in micro-neurosurgery, -neuro skull base surgery, and neuroendoscopy in the state-of-the-art neurosurgical innovations and training center for skull base and micro-neurosurgery at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City. He instructs fellows from around the world on the intricacies of skull base surgery techniques and works to expand the current understanding of complex surgical neuroanatomy by integrating intricate cadaveric dissections with 3D visualization, virtual reality, and computer simulation in order to enhance neurosurgical training and practice. Dr. Evans instructs two clinical neuroanatomy programs for medical students at Weill Cornell, and I personally had the pleasure of taking his elective course last year on surgical neuro neuroanatomy. More information on those courses is available at skullbaseneurosurgery.org. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Evans. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us again. For those uh, who joined us for our previous webinar on anterior circulation, this will roughly pick up where we left uh, off and, and hopefully complete the picture of cranial circulation. If you were not here for the last one, I encourage you uh, after to go and watch that on YouTube. Um, given that we're um, a fairly small group today, especially compared to last time, um, I encourage everyone to use the question and answer feature as we go, um, and I can stop along the way. We'll stop uh, at certain points to, to take questions, but uh, I'll keep an eye if, if questions pop up, we can, we can address them uh, right then. So let's get started. So in our last session, we reviewed anterior circulation and we followed the internal carotid from its origin in the neck until its bifurcation into the ACA and MCA, seeing everything that it crossed in its course. And we briefly looked at what MCA and ACA territory look like. Today, I'm going to ask you again to shrink down your perspective so we can travel through posterior circulation and see what we encounter um, there. Um, but let's first just quickly review the main elements of anterior circulation um, and some basic anatomy um, because we're going to be jumping around a little bit in terms of perspectives today. So I want to make sure everyone is comfortable with what we're looking at um, and oriented. Uh, our previous journey along the internal carotid followed a map known as the Boutier or the Van Lovren classification, which numbers the segments of the ICA from proximal to distal following the blood flow. And we started in the neck um, at the carotid bifurcation. Uh, where the common carotid splits to give rise to the internal and external carotid arteries. Um, this is where our first segment begins. And that's, of course, the cervical or C1 segment, um, which extends from the bifurcation um, until the entrance of the ICA into the carotid canal. Um, and it doesn't give off any branches. As the carotid comes up and enters the carotid canal, we enter the petrous segment, the C2 petrous segment, uh, which makes that first big bend right here. Um, and it bends anteromedially inside the petrous bone, giving off the carotico-tympanic and vidian arteries until it reaches um, just uh, outside the foramen lacerum. Then we have the C3, or the, the lacerum segment, um, which bends upwards and travels underneath the, the petrolingual ligament and entering uh, the cavernous sinus and becomes the cavernous segment or the C4 cavernous segment. And this segment has um, a quite a torturous, tortuous course as it comes up and then it bends uh, and courses anteriorly and inferiorly, slightly kinking medially here. And then it comes up and has another genu and a big bend as it comes up, uh, passing through the proximal dural ring underneath the anterior clinoid process. As it comes up, remember it gives off the meningohypophyseal trunk here and the infralateral trunk down here. And it comes up, exits the cavernous sinus through the proximal dural ring. And uh, actually here we can see the meningohypophyseal trunk. So this is that first genu as it comes up. All the way over here, it's inside the carotid canal and the petrous bone. So it's coming up underneath fifth nerve over frame and lacerum, bending up, entering the cavernous sinus at the petrolingual ligament, coming up, 
and bending to go inferior and anterior. And you can see that slight lateral kinking right here. It kinks a little bit outward. And then uh, and that first bend, it gives off the meningohypophyseal trunk. Down here, it gives off the infralateral trunk, and it also gives off the Connell's capsular arteries. And then it exits the cavernous sinus about here, um, underneath where the anterior clinoid process would be, which is, here, right side is uh, extradural because the dura has been removed. Left side here is intradural. So the dura here is all covering. Here's the pre of the tentorium, covering where the anterior clinoid would be over here. Um, and so this is where the clinoid would be. And this is our clinoid segment of the carotid between the proximal and distal dural rings. So uh, this segment extends between the rings and it's both extra cavernous and extra dural. And it then goes through the distal dural ring here. We see it extra durally here. We can see it intradurally. And this marks the dural entrance of the carotid. So the carotid enters the dura by traveling through the distal dural ring. And then it becomes the C6 uh, or ophthalmic segment. Actually, sorry, let's, let's hold on for a second. Since we're extra dural, um, here's that distal dural ring. Just uh, as a neat little note, so this is the clinoid ICA where the clinoid's been removed. Here's V1. And if, and if we cut that distal dural ring, we can then be and see intradural. And there's second nerve. And there's the ophthalmic artery. And this is the clinoid ICA. And then this is distal dural ring. And then this is the ophthalmic segment of the ICA. So it comes superiorly coursing posteriorly as it turns back, giving off the ophthalmic uh, artery. And so now um, it all actually it also gives off the superior hypophyseal artery, which we can see here. So clinoid ICA, distal dural ring, intradural C6 ICA gives off ophthalmic and superior hypophyseal arteries. So now let's transition to a, an intradural perspective to see the rest of the carotid. So here we have a right side sylvian fissure open. Here's our temporal lobe, here's our frontal lobe, here's the sylvian fissure open, um, and the, the more distal aspects of the MCA here are exposed. So if we zoom into this region here, we can start to see the right optic nerve, right where that right, uh, sorry, right, right where that white arrow is pointing. And uh, we can zoom in even further. And Let's just orient ourselves quickly. So this is a right side. This is, you know, we're from a lateral perspective looking medial. This direction is anterior. This direction is posterior. Down here would be inferior. This direction up would be superior. Um, so we are entirely intradural here. We can see that same portion of the carotid that we just saw. This is that distal dural ring. So the carotid's entering the dura and we're now intradural. Here's the ophthalmic artery arising from that C6 segment. And you can even see the superior hypophyseal artery right here coming off the carotid. Um, and this C6 segment extends all the way until just proximal to the posterior communicating artery, which is about here. We don't see it from this perspective. Um, and, um, and the posterior communicating artery, of course, connects anterior to posterior circulation, which we'll be seeing in, in detail in a little bit. Um, via anastomosing with the, with the posterior cerebral artery. And finally, we have the C7 uh, ICA, which extends from the posterior communicating artery, um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, from, from the posterior communicating artery until the internal carotid bifurcation, which gives rise um, to the ACA, which goes medially, and the MCA, which goes laterally. And there's our posterior communicating artery. We also have the anterior choroidal artery here as well. So there's that anterior clinoid process, free of the tentorum. We can see third nerve exiting the dura through the ocular motor triangle here, coming off down into the, exiting the dura in cavernous sinus on its way to the superior orbital fissure, just like we saw last time. Um, and then here's that carotid coming up. This is right where that anterior clinoid would be, going through the proximal distal dural ring, entering the dura and coursing superiorly and posteriorly to break off and or to branch off into the ACA and MCA and connecting posteriorly with the posterior communicating artery. 
So collectively, you know, this is pretty much everything we saw last time. Again, we're intradural because the dura has been left on the right, extradural on the left. We can see fifth nerve uh, and uh, we can see third nerve here, second nerve. So two, three, four is going to be running with the free edge of the tentorium, which we see here. Um, and uh, we here we have the basal artery coming up, which we're going to see in quite in depth. Um, and uh, here's our carotid entering the dura coming up. Here's that posterior communicating artery connecting from uh, the carotid to the uh, PCA. And we have our MC, sorry, ACA medially connecting by the anterior communicating artery and MCA, which is going laterally. We can also see our anterior choroidal artery. Um, so uh, now I know that was an extremely rapid overview, but if you're confused by any of that, just go back and rewatch the previous lecture where we went, where, where we went over all of this area um, in depth. So yeah, last time we spent the majority of our time in the anterior and middle cranial fossa. Today we're going to be focusing on the posterior cranial fossa. So this is a top-down view of the midline skull base. The top of the image here is anterior, the bottom uh, is inferior and posterior, and the left and right sides are lateral. The key bony landmarks we're going to see along our journey today are the clivus, which is the central bone of the skull base, and where we'll find the basilar trunk and the vertebral basilar junction. And um, it connects to the petrous portions of the temporal, uh, the temporal bones. Um, and let's have a closer look here at this. We're gonna take on a, a perspective uh, using a helicopter today. Um, and so we're just zooming in here. So I'm going to, <clears throat> here is the clivus. So this is the long axis of the clivus in this direction. Um, so up in this direction would be superior and down would be inferior. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we're hovering in the posterior fossa and we're looking right here at the posterior surface of the petrous bone. And we're looking past the ridge here. This is the petrous ridge. And we're looking from the posterior fossa, here's the posterior surface of the petrous bone, and we're looking up and over into the middle fossa here. So where we can see this, what do you think this is? I see uh, there's some issues with my pointer. Let me try and sort that. Is that better now? Can you see that? Okay, so uh, yeah, that, most of you were correct there. That is the foramen ovale. So let's, let's zoom out again, just to make sure that we understand this perspective. So there's the foramen ovale. There's our helicopter, from, that's our, our perspective is from that helicopter is the big image. So you can see we're projecting, we're looking all the way here at the posterior surface of the petrous bone. We're looking up and over and we can see the foramen ovale there. So other than the petrous segment of the ICA, the petrous bone also contains the internal auditory canal through which um, cranial nerve seven and eight, as well as the labyrinthine and subarcuate arteries pass. So it's a very, petrous bone is a highly trafficked structure. We have a lot coming in here. We have the, the, the labyrinth, we have the carotid, we have all sorts of stuff going on, including seventh and eighth nerve. And here, 
that can, you know, between the clivus here and the petrous bone here, we, they're connected by the petroclival fissure. And that junction um, over which we'll find the inferior petrosal sinus as it's coming down here on its course to the jugular bulb. And as we'll see as we go along today, we're also going to find the superior petrosal sinus running inside the tentorium along the petrous ridge here. And you can see that in the image here. So we have, you know, the cavernous sinus draining down. We have the superior petrosal sinus running along the petrous ridge. Um, over here is transverse sigmoid junction, sigmoid sinus coming down, inferior petrosal sinus running in the groove right here uh, in that fissure um, on its way down towards the jugular frame. And we're going to fill in the rest today. Down here is a groove where we would expect to find the sigmoid sinus, just like we see here. And the sigmoid sinus, as it comes down, curves, enters the jugular foramen, uh, and joins with the inferior petrosal sinus to, to form that jugular bulb. And of course, here's the jugular foramen, which we'll be seeing in a lot more detail shortly. And here's where we're going to find cranial nerves uh, 9, the glossopharyngeal, 10, the vagus, uh, and 11, the accessory exiting the skull along with the sigmoid sinus and the inferior petrosal sinus. Moving down from the jugular foramen, we of course find the hypoglossal canal where we find the hypoglossal nerve, 12th nerve. And last but not least, the largest and most highly trafficked, this is of course the foramen magnum through which we find um, the medulla, the accessory nerve, the vertebral artery, and the anterior and posterior spinal arteries. So our goal today, in addition to covering posterior circulation, is to understand how those vessels fit in with the surrounding structures, particularly cranial nerves uh, 7 through 12. You can see here, um, there, you can see here, uh, there's a lot going on. Last time we started at the bottom in the neck, we actually started right down here because this is the external carotid. This is the internal carotid here. So the carotid bifurcation is just beneath the picture. And we started and we worked our way up through the carotid into the entrance to the carotid canal here, into the petrous bone, and so on. Today, we're going to start in the middle. We're going to start in the cerebellopontine angle, and we're going to work our way down along the cranial nerves to understand the surrounding anatomy. And then we're going to go down to the cranial cervical junction, and we're going to work our way back up via the uh, posterior circulation. So we started last time by spending a while looking at this region in the middle fossa um, on, the, on the anterior surface here of the petrous bone, um, including uh, fifth nerve, uh, GSPN coming underneath, um, fourth nerve running with that free edge of the tentorium, third nerve in its straight course, down over the posterior clinoid process, exiting the dura uh, via the ocular motor triangle, entering the cavernous sinus on its way to the superior orbital fissure. I should say fourth nerve also, you know, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus. Um, we have second nerve here coming on top of the ophthalmic segment of the carotid um, and uh, entering the optic canal on its way to the orbit. Here's our anterior clinoid process. Here's our pituitary gland. Um, and here's second nerve on the other side. Here's uh, uh, the posterior clinoid on the other side. Um, and this is contralateral third nerve also exiting via the ocular motor triangle. Fourth nerve exiting into the cavernous sinus. Um, contralateral five entering Meckel's cave. And we're going to be seeing a little bit more of this from a different perspective. But remember that fifth nerve going up and then over that petrous ridge into the middle fossa. Um, as well as sixth nerve entering Dorello's canal, also going into the cavernous sinus. Um, so today we're going to be moving to the posterior surface, like we said, of the temporal bone, um, inferior to the level of the petrous ridge. So right, right where that, we're going to be coming down right where that 
white arrow uh, is um, just in this area underneath uh, fifth nerve. So to do that, we're going to take on the perspective of a retrosigmoid approach. So coming from behind the sigmoid sinus on the right side, removing the bone, opening the dura, and we're gonna put our virtual microscope in the field and, and zoom in. And then we're gonna retract that right cerebellar hemisphere medially to reveal our cranial nerve complexes here. And here would be fifth nerve at the very top. That's, our, that's the upper portion and then seven and eight in the middle and nine, 10, 11, and 12 on the bottom. And we're going to start here and we're going to work all the way down. So here we are. Let's reorient ourselves again. Now we're hovering in the posterior fossa, looking down the long axis of the petrous bone, just like the yellow arrows, or the yellow arrow uh, right here. And we are lateral looking medial towards the clivus. So the first thing we see from this perspective is the superior cerebellar artery. And the superior cerebellar artery, as we'll come again and see, comes off the basilar artery. So here we have that free edge of the tentorium right here. And this, the tentorium has been cut. So we're looking, we're looking in this direction. Um, and here's our fourth nerve, which originates all the way posteriorly on the back of the brainstem and wraps around midbrain coming up, joining a free edge of the tentorium um, and going into the cavernous sinus. And so just deep to that or more medial to that here, here we have our SCA which is coming and wrapping around posteriorly and medially to supply the superior surface of the cerebellum, hence superior cerebellar artery. Then we have fourth nerve, as we saw last time, running with that free edge. Now remember, the cranial nerves are numbered from superior to inferior. So as we move down, the numbers will increase, which means we now find fifth nerve. So this is that posterior view um, of the fifth nerve that we, we were just looking at a minute ago in the middle fossa and we spent a lot of time looking at before. And this is it inside the cerebellum pontine angle. And it's called that because here's the cerebellum, there's the pons, and you're creating an angle between them and all the structures that fall in between. And as we're looking deep along that long axis of the petrous bone, we can see fifth nerve coming off its origin in the root entry zone of five, going doing that, as we said, up and over that petrous ridge, which we don't fully see here, but this is where it would be, entering Meckel's cave um, and um, uh, trifurcating in the middle fossa. So down here, what do we have here with this bony lump on top? This is, of course, uh, the IAC. Our perspective here is that of the green arrow. And in the main image, we can see seven and eight entering the IAC along with the ICA here, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, um, which also comes off the basal artery. And we, we know the basal artery runs along the clivus, so that would be in this direction, because here's the clivus, here's that petroclival fissure, and we're looking right here at that bump, which is the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And actually, we can see the ICA passing through, in this case, the, seven, uh, the seventh and eighth nerve forming um, its loop. So now, let's just take this perspective and move a little bit more superior um, and put ourselves in the perspective of that helicopter pilot. So we're going to climb up. And as we zoom out, we can see more from the top and we can add in some more things that we've seen previously. Here, we have the tentorium, which has been cut right here. We can see it on both sides of our screen 
and this is where it was cut so we can see everything that's there. Now on the right side of the image, um, we can see that it's attaching to the Petrus Ridge, which is running right here, um, within which runs the, that superior uh, petrosal sinus. We can also see branches of the SCA here. They're coming off and supplying that superior surface of the cerebellum. So we're hovering here looking medial. Where is this arrow pointing? And the majority of the structures here are located where? I'm asking this just to, to gauge your understanding of what we're looking at. So to see if we need to reorient at all. Okay, so uh, the majority of you were, were correct. The arrow is pointing into the middle fossa. So this is that Petrus ridge. We're hovering in the, in the posterior fossa here. Our arrow pointing into the middle fossa. This is the Petrus ridge. So imagine this like some sort of mountainous canyon. So you can walk up to the edge in the middle fossa all the way out of the edge of the Petrus ridge and you can look down and there's this big gorge or drop here on the side of this mountain. And within this mountain, you know, there, there are caves like the internal auditory canal where, you know, things go in and then come out elsewhere. So, and then on, on that ridge there, we have this flowing river, if you will, that is the superior petrosal sinus. So we have the superior petrosal sinus here, that inferior petrosal sinus, which would be running in this direction. Um, we don't really see from this perspective, but yes, this is middle fossa. And everything behind this or to the left of this in the image is posterior fossa and everything beneath this level is infratentorium. And remember the tentorium is that dural structure that contains the venous sinuses and it also separates you know everything um, uh, beneath the cortex or it separates the cortex from everything else beneath it. Um, so it runs just on the superior surface of the cerebellum here um, and it runs and it separates vertically from uh, the cortex in the same way that the fox separates the left and right hemispheres and those those structures are all uh, congruent with each other so yeah very good so i'm glad everyone is you know, is uh, oriented well here so underneath the tentorium we of course see fifth nerve and we see fifth nerve coming again from its root entry zone, exiting the dura, entering Meckel's cave, up and over the Petrus Ridge, and trifurcating in the middle fossa, as we've seen before. From anterior, this is an anterior perspective, looking back, there's that root entry zone. So we're hovering, our helicopter is probably over here. So um, when we're looking at it, from the side perspective, now we're looking at it from front to back in this image, and we can see it coming off, coming up and over. The Petrus Ridge has been drilled a little bit here, but it comes up and over, and of course trifurcates into V1 and V2, which enter the cavernous sinus, V1 going through the superior orbital fissure, V2 going through the foramen rotundum, and V3 going through the foramen ovale. And as it comes up and over uh, the Petrus Ridge right here, we can see also, which has been cut here as well, um, we can see that superior petrosal sinus, um, which would be running along the, uh, along the Petrus Ridge. So if this is the fifth nerve, what does that make this? Well, by, by nature of deduction alone, that's the sixth nerve because we're moving down. So yeah, this is the sixth nerve. Remember, fifth nerve has a, a, a very short um, intradural direct course, goes slightly up and then over that petrous ridge and then down into the middle fossa um, along its, the anterior surface of the petrous bone. Sixth nerve comes up a, a direct upwards course, um, just uh, 
just above that petroclival fissure um, and uh, it enters Dorello's Canal, entering the cavernous sinus um, underneath V1 all the way until it gets the superior orbital fissure. I see the questions popped up. The yellow arrow pointing to the middle fossa was supertentorial and to the left with the neurovascular structures were located infratentorially. That is correct, yes. And of course, um, as, we've, as we've just seen here, we have seven and eight entering the internal auditory canal. That, that little guy in the middle between them is the nervous intermedius. So let's keep moving inferiorly to see the rest of our, our lower cranial, or the, the lower cranial nerves here. Um, but as we descend, keep your eyes on seven and eight. This will be our reference as we move down. The same way five was our reference when we were looking uh, up here, as we move down, seven and eight are gonna be our reference. So we're gonna keep them highlighted as we switch perspectives. So now we're just a bit, a bit lower. Seven and eight still highlighted here as they enter the IAC. We can see six nerve deep to that. Um, and looking to the nerves below us, we first find ninth nerve. So remember five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Now, most of the nerves here either had a slightly upward or, or um, uh, straight course. These have a slightly inferior course. And nine is going from its origin, straight, a little bit inferior until it enters the jugular foramen, passing just underneath, in this case, the pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery which again, we're gonna come back to when we come back up and see that circulation. So, and, and here, this all, and which also the pica comes off the vertebral artery. And we also have 10th nerve, the vagus nerve, uh, which is of, of course a very important nerve, has a lot of function. Um, and it's, and you, you can tell that from its, uh, from its size, the number of rootlets we see here. So the vagus nerve, 10th nerve comes off, also a straight course inferior to nine, directly into the jugular foramen here. And then we have the accessory nerve, the 11th nerve, which has two main components. It has its cranial component, which have rootlets that are in a uh, direct course um, into the jugular foramen, as well as its spinal course that's coming up through the foramen magnum joining with its cranial components and going into the jugular frame. And just superficial here to the lower cranial nerves, we can also see the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle and the foramen of Lushka. So given our retrosigmoid perspective, note those yellow arrows are pointing in the same medial direction along that long axis of the petrous bone. What would you guess those green uh, arrows are pointing to at the midline there? We're going to be coming back to these shortly, but these of course are the left or the right and left vertebral arteries coming up to form the vertebral basilar junction here. So this is the midline, there's the right and left verts coming up vertebral basilar junction and then we have the basilar trunk coming up along the clivus. Since we're looking medial um, along the long axis of the posterior surface of the petrous bone, what do you think this is? So it seems the results on this one are a little bit more mixed. 
that the majority seem to think this is the sigmoid sinus. Well, yes, this is the sigmoid sinus. Remember, from that perspective, we're retrosigmoid. So we're posterior to the sigmoid sinus. Um, so meaning that everything, that our cerebellum is on the left and the dura with the sigmoid sinus running into it would be on the right. So we're kind of following this green arrow here. I tried to draw it in as, as best I could, but it's a, it's a little bit of a tough perspective. But we're taking that, as you see here, we're retracting that um, cerebellum uh, medially and we're looking straight down past it onto the long axis in this direction where my pointer is in, in that direction, um, same highlighted by that green arrow here, all the way towards the midline. In, you know, and when we're talking about the skull base, we often talk about the clivus um, as the target of, of many skull base uh, openings. And um, it's, it's quite true because at the, at the deep end of, of all of these perspectives, you're pointing towards the clivus, which is at the center. And here you can see, you know, the, the confluence of sinuses, um, you know, by the occiput uh, coming around with the transverse sinus, transverse sigmoid junction, and this is the area we're working in just posterior to the sigmoid sinus. Sigmoid sinus comes down, goes in that groove we talked about before, um, you know, drains into the uh, jugular bulb, jugular foramen, becomes the internal jugular vein. And we're going to see that in a little bit more depth. So we can zoom out a little to see the craniocervical junction, in addition to all of the uh, intracranial components we just looked at, um, the courses of all the lower cranial nerves. And this is the same perspective, just zoomed out a little bit. You know, this is our cranial direction in this, uh, this way. So this is superior, uh, actually it was superior, anterior, inferior. And we can look, again, there's that, um, there's seven and eight going into the IAC. There's that, that fundus, the bump of the IAC we talked about before. Uh, as we move down, we can see the posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. We have nine, 10, and 11, both the spinal and cranial components going all into the jugular foramen. Here's the inferior petrosal vein. Um, and down here, we have 12 on its much lower, but very straight, very direct, very short intracranial course to enter the hypoglossal canal. And uh, underneath all of those, we have the vertebral artery coming up and coursing underneath and around to wrap around the brainstem and become anterior. So now let's move slightly anterior and take a look at what happens once all of those nerves enter and go through the jugular foramen and hypoglossal canal respectively. So first we have ninth nerve. So again, ninth nerve, short, direct, slightly inferior course coming here to the jugular foramen. And notice how nine is separated from 10 and 11 by a small bony prominence here, a small bony septum. It passes superiorly over the rest. On top of, the inter, on top of that interjugular septum, highlighted in yellow, this upper compartment is often referred to as the pars nervosa. And it contains ninth nerve and receives the inferior petrosal sinus. And ninth nerve, comes through and emerges extracranially as the most superficial and the most anterior uh, of the nerves. And you can see that here. Here's nine coming through and it comes out as the most anterior and the most superficial on top uh, of the carotid here, almost on top. Um, as the carotid comes up, remember this is our cervical segment of the internal carotid coming up, entering that carotid canal here becoming the petri segment of the carotid. So um, yeah, here you can also see, here's, here, uh, here it is coming in, uh, nine coming in, there's that interjugular septum separated, and you can see how it comes out and on top of the carotid. Here's the carotid coming up, entering the carotid canal. 
Then we have the 10th nerve, the vagus nerve. So rootlets coming together like a fan. You know, it, it handles a lot, so it's, it has a lot going on there. And it comes together um, and comes through, enters the jugular foramen. And it enters beneath that interjugular septum. And this lower compo the compartment is often referred to as the pars vascularis. And 10 comes through the pars vascularis and emerges deep to 9 and passes underneath the carotid. And we can see that here. Here's 10, comes through, emerges, and it comes deep to the carotid. And you, can, you don't see the carotid here, but you kind of get the idea. And then at the same time, you can see the vert here coming up um, and going underneath these nerves as it wraps around. And then we have, you know, um, 11th nerve, the accessory nerve, um, coming from its lower cranial origin, uh, as well as its spinal origin, a spinal component coming up, entering the foramen magnum, coming up, joining with its cranial component, and going through uh, the foramen magnum, I'm sorry, going through the jugular foramen, um, and entering the jugular foramen inferiorly to 10, and beneath the septum again, so 9, 10, 11, in the pars vascularis down here, exits posterior to the carotid, and all, in this case, are underneath the internal jugular vein, which you can see here. Here's where that jugular vein would be. And we can see the internal jugular vein with the left of it right here. Let's take a closer look at the uh, at the jugular vein. Oh, sorry, one second. Okay, so now, you know, here's that sigmoid sinus it's coming down. Uh, sigmoid sinus, you know, uh, jugular bulb coming through the jugular foramen, internal jugular vein coming out, and there it's it's cut so we can see the nerves underneath it, um, and it emerges superficial to all of the nerves coming through uh, the jugular foramen but deep to this other nerve up here. And this is the facial nerve. So this is seven. So seven, remember, has that short direct course into the IAC. And in, after the IAC, it, it goes into the, um, it moves around um, the lateral semicircular canal, comes into the fallopian canal, and then out through the stylomastoid foramen. And then it comes out extracranial. And it's gonna be superficial to, uh, you can see here, this is that lateral semicircular canal. It's wrapping around, entering the fallopian canal, coming out, stylomastoid foramen, extracranial, and superficial to the internal jugular vein. Um, and looking you know, from intracranial, again, we see that sigmoid sinus coming in. But interestingly, it's almost uh, you know, posterior to the cranial nerves here. Um, and it has this kind of interesting course where it comes down, jugular bulb goes through, and you can see it goes, uh, sorry, it goes underneath these cranial nerves before wrapping back around and emerging superficially. We can also very clearly see the internal carotid coming up, uh, entering the carotid canal right here. So the sigmoid sinus has been cut here, but you can, you can follow the course with the yellow arrow as it comes underneath the cranial nerves, um, with the exception of nine. So, uh, and then it comes in courses around or on back on top. There's our carotid. And finally, we have the uh, 12th nerve as it enters um, the hypoglossal canal. So the hypoglossal nerve coming in, entering the hypoglossal canal um, underneath the jugular foramen, which is up here. Here's, oh, here's our vertebral artery coming underneath everything, like we said. Here's that spinal component of the accessory coming up and joining with nine in that superior compartment and uh, 10 in that inferior compartment within the jugular foramen exiting and we have 12 
entering the hypoglossal canal and coming out over here. So, and in the middle of all that, we have the, the right vertebral artery coming up, passing underneath all of these nerve rootlets, underneath and on its anterior and superior course. So, now we can find the origin of the vertebral artery and work our way back up via the arteries. But first, are there any questions about uh, the intracranial courses of cranial nerve 7 through 12? Uh, sure, let's go back. Okay, so there's a question here um, about the relationship between the internal jugular vein um, and um, its relationship with cranial nerves. Uh, seven, nine, seven and, and nine. So let's take a closer look at that quickly before we keep going. Okay, so <clears throat> here uh, we have nine, um, 10, 11, and 12 is that deep one coming here. This muscle is the um, rectus capitis lateralis. And here's our, here's C1, and here's our vertebral artery coming up. Um, and you can see, so 12, um, 11, 10, and nine. And seven and eight are up here. So nine is gonna come in and around, going through the, um, the pars nervosa coming out of the jugular foramen and it's most um, anterior. And then on top of all of that, the, in, the internal jugular vein is gonna emerge, um, extracranial and retrostyloid. And it's gonna come up on, out on top. And but when it comes out on top, it's still deep to seventh nerve. And we can see that on the right side here. And um, seventh nerve, comes out, the, the mastoid's been removed in this picture, but this is that same portion right here on the left and on the right that we're looking at. So here's seventh nerve in the fallopian canal and it's coming out and you can see here, this is just superficial to the internal jugular vein. So here's sigmoid sinus coming down, jugular bulb coming out um, into the internal jugular vein underneath seventh nerve and on top of the rest that you can start to see over here, and then you can see a little bit more clearly in this image. Um, I don't know if that answered your question fully, but we can come back at the end and talk about that a little bit more. Uh, okay, so now let's add in the major vessels. So the, the main reason why, I, why everyone's uh, here today. So we've already traveled along uh, the ICA and we've seen its terminal branches, uh, the ACA and the MCA. Now let's take a look at the vertebral arteries. Like the carotid is the main vessel anteriorly, the vertebral arteries are the, of course the main vessels that supply posterior cranial circulation. And we can, we can easily break down the vertebral artery into its four main segments. The first is the preferaminal segment. And you know, its name really corresponds to its features. It travels up along uh, the spinal column and it doesn't go through any foramina. So it goes straight up uh, from the subclavian all the way up to just beneath the C6 foramen transversorum. So you know, here are spinous processes, cervical spine, and you know, on the lateral aspect, we have, of course, the foramen transverse aria and through which the vertebral artery passes. So our second segment is the foraminal segment. And this is where C6, I'm sorry, this is where the vertebral artery travels up through the C6 foramen transverse arium, up through C5, C4, C3, um, C2, and um, 
And this is where we have our next segment. So preforaminal, foraminal, and then we have our suboccipital segment. And this is very useful because you can find the location of this uh, within what's called the suboccipital triangle of muscles here. And there are a lot of muscles that connect uh, with the, uh, in, in this craniocervical junction region. And um, so from C2, uh, it comes up, um, it goes through the C1 foramen transversorum, curves around and enters the dura, and we have our intracranial segment beginning at the foramen magnum all the way to the vertebral basilar junction where the vert uh, ceases to exist, becomes the basilar artery. So this is an anterior view, um, and we can see here preforaminal, subclavian, all the way just proximal to C6, and then foraminal from the C6 foramen transversorium to the C2 foramen transversorium. And then we have uh, the suboccipital segment from the C2 up to the foramen magnum. And this is where uh, like the ICA, the vertebral artery takes on this torturous course. At this point, it's not interacting with anything other than its own venous plexus and muscles and bone. There's not a lot of cranial nerve action going on here um, or even spinal nerve root because um, everything would be uh, down here. Um, and uh, we can look at another point at the dural relationships. But um, the VA uh, comes up through the frame in the transversorium of C2, very straight course up through the C1, and then it has this first genu, the first bend. And let's take a look from a lateral perspective. It's kind of an oblique view, actually. Um, so here's, you know, here's C1, here's C2, spinous process. So this is truly posterior, and this direction up is, is uh, um, superior and we're, we're posterior looking in this direction anterior. So we can see coming up, frame and transversarium, and then we have that first major bend. And we're curving posteriorly and slightly um, medi or medially and, and slightly anteriorly, um, but we're turning around in this direction backwards. So we're going up and we're turning. And after this turn here, the vertebral artery falls into this little groove. And this little groove on C1 is known as the sulcus arteriosus. And it kind of provides a nice little uh, hand or a little support underneath the vert as it comes up. And then it, it courses again, it bends again, and then it moves superior as it enters the dura um, around the foramen magnum. So let's have a closer look. So, um, here, this is um, a posterior to anterior perspective. We're looking straight onto the spine from behind, and we can see that vertebral artery coming out of the C1 frame and transversorium. We can see that uh, first uh, uh, posterior um, and medial bend right here, and it's going on top of the sulcus arteriosus. Um, here we actually see the, C, the C1 nerve root. Um, and then we see it coming up and then it's curving again until it pierces the dura and becomes intradural. Here is that, um, for, here's the opening of the foramen magnum. Um, and you can see a little bit here of the occipital condyle that's, that's been drilled. Um, and then here's the, here's the dura surrounding the brainstem. And here's where we would expect to find cerebellum. So now we can look inside the dura to see the vertebral artery as it pierces the dura and continues to curve up superiorly, going underneath those lower cranial nerves, which are you know, nine through 12, before wrapping anteriorly around the spinal cord and brainstem. So it's coming up the sides and it's kind of hugging around, like you would give somebody a hug with your hands. It comes up and hugs around um, the brainstem uh, towards the clivus anteriorly before forming that vertebral basilar junction. So now in this perspective here, here we have, you can see this, this is the dura right here. So here are, um, you know, here's our, our C2 uh, spinal nerve uh, right here. C1, this is extradural. Everything to the left of this line is intradural. 
So this is where the dura was open. So you can see the C1 spinal nerve rootlets going into the nerve itself. Here are the rootlets for C2 going out, extra dural. Um, here is uh, C1 that's been cut, uh, laminectomy here. Um, and here's our frame and magnum. So what do we think this guy is right here? I don't have a question for this one, but um, I'll tell you this, this is, this is the spinal component of the accessory nerve that's coming up to join with its cranial component and enter the jugular foramen. So here's our frame and magnum. Here's the verte right vertebral artery coming in. Here's its dural entrance. So remember, it's running along that sulcus arteriosus, then it's coming up, entering the dura, coming in, going underneath all of these highly trafficked cranial nerve areas, um, and wrapping around anteriorly, giving that brainstem a nice hug as it, as it meets its contralateral counterpart um, on the clivus, and they form the vertebral basilar junction. Now, in this perspective, remember, here's, here's the Fremen magnum, right? This is the level of the Fremen magnum. So above us is where we would expect to find the cerebellum. So if we look up from this perspective, we can see those cerebellar hemispheres. And if we move our perspective up and we lift up one of those cerebellar hemispheres, we reveal the pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So in most cases, the pica originates um, from the intradural intracranial vertebral artery, but its origin is pretty variable. 20% of the time it, it arises extracranially inferior to the frame and magnum. 10% um, of the time it arises, uh, arises from the basal artery. Um, sometimes they're absent. Um, so it, it's a bit variable. Um, but we can see here, here's our vertebral artery coming up, entering the dura right here. And this is uh, the origin of the uh, pike actually right here where my pointer is. It looks like it's over here, but this is just the, uh, I think it's wrapping around. Um, and it comes right here, comes down, it has this nice tortuous course. So let's, let's have a look and follow the course of the pica quickly. So this is a left side, right? This is our, we're, we're from posterior, we're looking anterior. Um, this is the left cerebellar hemisphere, we're lifting up. And as we can see here, as it arises from the vertebral artery right here, it forms its anterior medullary segment. And why? Well, in most cases, it's, it's about at the level of the medulla on its anterior surface, hence anterior medullary segment. So it comes off of the vert anterior medullary segment and it courses laterally around, again, in most cases around the medulla, so it forms its lateral medullary segment, and then it starts to come inferiorly. And this is a very classic, um, course for the pica because it forms this loop here that's commonly known as the caudal loop of the pica. In, in cerebrovascular surgery, if you're doing bypass, it's a common bypass site um, because it's very superficial for posterior revascularization and easy to get to. Um, and so it comes down, and in this, this is called the tonsillo medullary segment because, you know, hence the medulla and the cerebellar tonsils. Um, so it comes down, it forms this caudal loop um, and we, you know, obviously caudal because it's going in, in the direction of the cauda and it turns around and it comes back up and it comes underneath the cerebellar hemisphere. It's a really tortuous vessel. It has, it has quite a, an interesting course. So it comes back down, it comes out or, you know, goes around and then down caudal loop coming all the way back up underneath the hemisphere. Um, and forming the telovelotonsillar segment. And then it comes up and it comes up and then it courses down again. Uh, it comes up, it courses all the way down and it kind of envelops the uh, cerebellar hemisphere from inferior. You can see that here, that's that it comes up, it turns down. And then from the medial aspect right here, it hugs it all the way around supplying blood uh, through the cortical segments. So uh, the pica, you know, very interesting, very torturous vessel. Um, and it arises, um, actually we'll see when we go anteriorly at the level with which it arises. So now that we see, we've seen the pica from posterior, let's keep following those vertebral arteries as they course anterior.
So in this image, the brain has been taken out here for the most part. So we can see those verts coming up, wrapping around, like we said, here they are coming up. Here's the dural entrance coming up, going underneath all those lower cranial nerves, um, coming up and uh, wrapping around anteriorly and forming that vertebro, sorry, forming that vertebro basilar junction um, on the clivus, right? So here's the midline, here's the clivus, and this is where we would expect to see that petroclival fissure we saw earlier. Um, and then this is that long axis of the posterior surface of the petrous bone, because here we have seven and eight, here's our petrous ridge, here's fifth nerve coming up and over, um, and there's uh, our, in this direction would be the superior petrosal sina. So we have five um, and <clears throat> six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 down here. So in this case, we can also see the pica coming out. Um, this is a much higher origin than we looked in the last slide. So pica is branching off here. Um, in this case, it's kind of pulling uh, uh, what looks like uh, ninth nerve uh, or, or a root with it, and then it's coming up and coursing around, going between the nerves, entering the jugular foramen um, as it loops back around. I think this is, you know, this has been manipulated a little bit, but this one uh, is a little bit more of a natural course. And if we move that brainstem entirely, we can see also the anterior spinal artery that's uh, going down anteriorly to the spine. So now we're going to switch from this posterior view to an anterior view, looking posterior. So let's just reorient ourselves. So now we're sitting anteriorly, we're basically sitting on top of the anterior cranial fossa, and we're looking purely posteriorly in the midline. And um, so here, this is the left side, this is the right side, and we can see those for that vertebral artery coming up right here on both sides, joining together to form the vertebral basilar junction and form the basilar trunk, which is the basilar artery, the, you know, the majority of it, and from which we get the ica, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, which comes out in courses between, near seven and eight, about the level of the seventh and eighth nerve as they enter the IAC, right? So which we can see right here. Here's seven and eight. Here's the ICA. Actually, sorry. Here's, here, oh yeah, here's the ICA, and that ICA also forms a loop. In this case, it's coming up and going through seven and eight. Uh, it might be a little bit different on the other side, but here's the ICA coming off the basilar artery um, at about at the level of seven and eight. And um, we can also see here, here's the pica coming off the vertebral artery, inferior to uh, the level of the uh, ica. In this case, this one's wrapping around like we saw. So anterior medullary, um, lateral medullary, and coming around and coursing inferiorly, caudally, to form that caudal loop. And if we just take a quick look of where we are anatomically, we're sitting here, right? So here's our second nerve going in in this direction towards the optic canal on top of the ophthalmic segment of the carotid artery. Here's our pituitary gland, our hypothesis. Uh, here's that free edge of the tentorium. You can kind of match up what's you know being cut here. So starting from the top, we have two, three, coming up, three uh, uh, coming up from its origin, three coming out, oculomotor triangle, cavernous sinus exiting. We have four, uh, with the free edge, uh, which would be around, right around here. And we can see it coming around from its, its origin posteriorly. It's wrapping around all the way, joining that free edge and coming out. We have fifth nerve here and here. You know, this is the fifth nerve root entry zone um, coming up and over that petrous ridge uh, and then trifurcating into V3, V2, and V1. And just beneath it, we have sixth nerve, um, going into Dorello's canal, and we can see sixth nerve here and here. And then we have seven and eight straight direct into the internal auditory canal. Um, don't forget the GSPN also comes off of the, of the geniculate ganglion from seventh nerve, geniculate ganglion. Then we have the greater superficial petrosal nerve 
running superior to and parallel to the Petrus carotid, which we can see here, coming underneath B3 on its way to the Vidian canals. Um, and um, let's zoom in a little bit closer on the right side and have a closer look. So same, same pretty much same perspective, right side, we're looking down, you know, here's the vertebral artery coming up, here's that vertebral basal junction, here's the pica coming up, and here's the ica coming off the basilar. So remember, pica comes off the vert, ica comes off the basilar trunk. Ica is about the level of seven and eight, fairly consistent, um, also forms a loop. Pica, variable, um, but at some point, usually intradural. Um, what we also see here, here's, remember, here's our third nerve going this way on top of the posterior clinoid. Fourth nerve again, wrapping around, so this is where the free edge of the tent would be. And if this is the free edge of the tent, it would mean that this vessel is infratentorial, which means that this would be the superior cerebellar artery. So the basal artery comes up, forms the basilar tip, gives off the SCA, and then splits into the PCAs, which we'll come back to. SCA comes around and supplies that superior surface of the cerebellum, like we saw before. So three, four, five, Six is right here, seven and eight right here. Seven and eight into the internal auditory canal and out and over. So remember, this is the middle fossa. This is that anterior surface of the petrous bone. This is where the petrous ridge was. And then everything down here, posterior fossa um, and uh, posterior circulation. Uh, we can also see here, we have a bunch of perforators that are going uh, to the brainstem midbrain from uh, the the vert and the basal, a high, a lot of perforators going on here of all vessels, not just uh, basilar, but SCA and ICA as well. Um, and if we go, now let's go to the, the other side, let's go to the left side and have a look because the dura here was removed. So let's look at, with the dura intact, what that looks like. So we're just zooming in on, on the left side here. We can still see that vertebral basilar junction. We have the left vert, right vert, Basilar trunk again, here's that ICA. You can see the ICA in this case is coming in, you know, going really towards seven and eight as they enter the IAC, giving off the labyrinthine and subarcuate arteries, very tiny going into the IAC. Um, here's the, the left cerebellar hemisphere. Um, we can see, again, fifth nerve on its straight course into Meckel's cave, sixth nerve right here going into Dorello's canal, third nerve right here, uh, fourth nerve right here, um, and then a little, if we look a little bit deeper, we can start to see those lower cranial nerves as they are entering the jugular foramen. Here we also have the superior petrosal vein, which is draining into that superior petrosal sinus, which is, as we see right here, running along that free edge of the tentorium. Let's go back, actually, you can see it a little more clearly here, because remember, here, uh, I'm sorry, running, running against the petrous ridge, I meant to say. Here's that petrous ridge like we've, that we've been looking at, same over here, and you can see exactly where that superior petrosal sinus is running. And this is just the vein that's draining into it. So um, this is a top-down view of the brainstem, and the brainstem is being retracted here. So we're, in this case, we're looking from the top down along that long axis of the clivus. Um, this is not uh, uh, the IAC, um, but I don't want to get you confused. This is where the posterior clinoids would be right here. Here's the carotid. Uh, here's the pituitary in the midline. So we're just pulling that brainstem back. And in this case, we're, we can see six nerve on its way to Dorello's canal, exiting the dura. Uh, Dorello's canal, remember, is roofed by the petrosphenoidal ligament or Gruber's ligament. And six nerve enters cavernous sinus underneath B1 on the way to the superior orbital fissure. So um, here, uh, so we have um, three, um, we don't really see four here, but five, six, and seven and eight down here. Um, and, but really, um, we're looking here at the vertebral basilar junction. So we can see those, those left and right verts coming together. We can see the ica coming off the basilar. And um, we can see the relationship, most importantly, between the clivus and the basilar artery. And... Um, we, we know that the, the basal artery runs along the clivus, 
Um, but the vertical point at which the vertebral arteries merge, the level of the vertebral basal or junction, can be variable. Um, and depending on where that is, it's known as high riding um, or low riding relative uh, to the clivus. So um, high riding or low riding basilar refers to the point at which the basilar artery forms in relation to the level of the clivus. Um, and here, this is a pretty normal riding uh, vertebral basilar junction. And uh, we have the vertebral basilar junction, ICA, SCA, and PCA is here. What this, this thing that's cut here is the posterior communicating artery. And that's sixth nerve. Okay, now, sorry we're jumping around so much in terms of views, but it's hard to show this from a single perspective. This is, this is the back of the head. So now we're, we're posterior looking anterior again, right? So here we see what's left of C1, um, and here's our vert coming along the sulcus arteriosus and entering the dura. So the left and right margins of the image are lateral, up is superior, and we're looking anteriorly. This is that anterior spinal artery we, we mentioned before. In many, many books and diagrams, you're always gonna see the, the basal artery as this straight structure. In, in, in many, many cases, the basal artery has curvature to it. Sometimes it has quite a bit of curvature and goes all around. It's not always straight. Um, so uh, let's go through this. Um, just to understand the vertical relationships between the vessels and the nerves in relation to the bone. So we're going to start superior and we're going to move inferior. So up here, I don't know if you notice, but here in, in yellow, um, this is just uh, underneath uh, the level of the carotids here um, coming out. So, and this is uh, probably about where our posterior clinoids are. So that's the third nerve. As we move down, we're gonna see the SCA, superior cerebellar artery. So when we have our PCAs up here, basilar tip, SCA, basilar trunk. All these little guys that are cut, these are all perforators. So moving down, here's that, here's fifth nerve. Um, we, don't we don't really see fourth here. You can see it right here, the tiny little guy right there. Um, but here we have fifth nerve. And you can see, remember, fifth nerve's coming up and over that petrous ridge, you can see that right here, going into the middle fossa. This is all the posterior surface of the petrous bone. There's that superior petrosal sinus running along the petrous ridge. There's the petrous ridge. Um, and this one has been drilled, so you can see there's the carotid in the petrous bone, in the carotid canal, coming up um, and emerging at the level of the frame and lacerum to become the lacerum segment over here. Um, and then all the way medial to it, at the junction, you know, right, right, up, right on top of that petroclival fissure we looked at before is where we'll find Dorello's canal. And that's where we're gonna find sixth nerve. And sixth nerve is going straight, entering Dorello's canal, uh, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus underneath V1 on its way to the superior orbital fissure. And so remember, third nerve is gonna be ab above the SCA. PCA is gonna be above um, everything from this perspective because it's supertentorial and everything else is infratentorial. Um, so uh, we have two, three, four, five, six. And then we have the ICA. And as we said, the ICA comes off the basilar. You can notice left and right side are not perfectly symmetrical either in this case. That's you know, often due to that curvature of the basilar artery. So it comes out, it f comes off at the level of seven and eight, and you know, oftentimes forms a loop in proximity to seven and eight as they enter the internal auditory canal. So seven and eight have that direct course from their origin as they enter seven and eight, and uh, I'm sorry, as they enter the IAC, and they go in their respective ways. We saw seven uh, exiting the skull before via the stylomastoid foramen. So there are seven and eight. And now as we move a little bit lower, we're now coming down, here's our vertebral basilar junction, here are our left and right vertebral arteries. We can see the pica 
of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery coming off of the verts. And you can see it again, it's at the level around the jugular foramen. Not always consistent, but uh, usually intradural um, and from uh, the vert, sometimes from the basal or sometimes absent, sometimes extradural. But most commonly, uh, intradural and it, it's somewhere around here because it does course around uh, the jugular frame. So remember, uh, relationship between three and SCA, which and relationship between three and the posterior clinoid process, um, and the basilar artery relationship with the clivus. Ica is about the level of seven and eight. Pica, variable, often intradural, and will come around uh, the you know, 9, 10, 11, going into the jugular frame. Here's that anterior spinal artery, C1. Here's the verts coming in. This is the dural entrance. That blue down there is all venous plexus that surrounds the vertebral artery, comes in, enters the dura, going underneath uh, all of those cranial nerves and giving off the pica. And then there's, of course, nine... 10 and um, 11 uh, going into the jugular frame. And 11, of course, has that spinal uh, component that comes in through the jugular frame and, um, I'm sorry, through the frame and magnum on its way to the jugular frame and meeting with its cranial component and going through. And, you know, last but not least, here we have 12th nerve. And 12th nerve, short and fear, of course, the hypoglossal canal going through the hypoglossal canal. Um, again, all uh, uh, the nerves are moving superior to the vertebral artery. So, so superior is not the right word. From this perspective, the, uh, I mean, the vert's going underneath, so anterior too. Um, so in this perspective, um, we're top down. This is a right side over here, right? Right skull base, this is that anterior surface. And then this is the, of the petrous bone. Here's that superior surface. You know, here's the, of course, uh, you know, the landmark I love to throw up because it's so apparent is fifth nerve as it comes up and over the petrous ridge. This is our superior petrosal sinus right here, running along that petrous ridge. This is where Meckel's cave would be. And you can see it in V1 and V2 going into the cavernous sinus, V3 going into ovale. And um, we can see from this image, uh, the um, SCA is coming around. So let's take a quick look at that. We're just zooming in there in that cerebellar pontine angle, but from above. So we were here laterally earlier. Now we're, we're looking at this area from above um, and we can see, um, uh, we can see that fifth nerve. There it is, intradural five going to Meckel's cave. And then just uh, by it, of course, we have the superior cerebellar artery. Now, why is this worth mentioning the proximity of the two? Well, because it, it's, the, the, a conflict between these two, a so-called neurovascular conflict between these two can manifest commonly um, as trigeminal neuralgia, which I'm, I'm sure you've uh, learned about in your studies. Um, and this can require a microvascular decompression where um, the offending vessel, whether it be the SCA, the ICA, um, has transposed and moved away to stop beating on the fifth nerve. That's why patients often complain of pulsatile sensations in these cases. So after the superior cerebellar artery, the basal artery uh, bifurcates into the left and right PCAs at the basilar tip. So this is the basilar tip. Basilar tip can form aneurysms too. Often these days those are coiled. Um, these, these are the first vessels in posterior circulation that are supertentorial as we can see here. So everything underneath them is going beneath the level of the, of the tentorium. Here's that free edge of the tentorium. Here's that SCA wrapping around. Remember, superior cerebellar. So think superior surface of the cerebellum. It's wrapping around, going on top of the superior surface of the cerebellum over here. And here's the PCA, which is coming up above the tentorium. We're gonna take a look at its supply in a minute. Also, the PCA, of course, uh, you know, anastomosis with the posterior communicating artery, which we see here coming off of that C7 communicating internal carotid, which is coming up, giving off uh, both the posterior communicating anterior choroidal and then bifurcating in laterally into the MCA 
anteriorly into the ACA, and those two are connected by the anterior communicating artery. So the PCA comes off um, as the terminal branch of the basilar, basilar, lateral to the basilar tip, and is both superior to cranial nerve three and the tentorium. It's, um, it's supertentorial, of course, like we said, and it's also posterior to the chiasm. So let's see, we can see this here from a superior and a lateral perspective. Um, you can see SCA is underneath three, three is coming up and down. Remember we say always three is going over that posterior clinoid, medial to the free edge of the tentorium into that ocular motor triangle. And then all of that is occurring uh, posterior to the optic chiasm where we find two. So let's take a look at that. What does that, what does that look like? So this is a lateral perspective. This is a right side. Um, where this is that free edge of the tentorium, we're above that free edge. So we're sort of, you know, we're sort of looking super tentorially. Um, and here is our carotid. This is our C7 communicating carotid, right? And we can see the carotid, carotid is giving off that posterior communicating artery. It's coming and it's attaching anastomosing with the posterior cerebral artery. Here we have the basilar trunk coming up, basilar tip. Uh, this is the PC on the right side, PC on the left side over here, and underneath it, you don't really see the origin right here, but it's right here. That's the superior cerebellar artery. So see, superior cerebellar artery is underneath third nerve, infratentorial, going around to the superior surface of the cerebellum. I wish I'd put a poll question in before about this, but what do we think this is right here? Well, this is obviously fourth nerve. Why is it fourth nerve? Uh, not only is it immediately below th three, but it's also coming from much more posterior. The fourth nerve has that, that really posterior origin as it wraps around the midbrain um, on its way to join that free edge of the tentorium. And then the bone we would expect to see, of course, right underneath three here is that posterior clinoid process. If I was going to retract the tentorium a little bit here, I'd see that ocular motor triangle as third nerve is exiting the dura. What am I looking at over here? Well, this is, uh, this is the right, this is the optic chiasm. This is the right uh, uh, optic nerve. Um, in the middle would be the laminal terminalis. If we followed that all the way back up and we, we went through everything, we'd be in the third ventricle, the optic recess of the third ventricle. And uh, if we follow this, here's our communicating ICA. If it's going, it's bifurcating laterally into the MCA, anteriorly into the ACA, and we may just get a rare glimpse of that, uh, I shouldn't say rare, glimpse of that anterior communicating artery over here. So the part of the brain we mentioned briefly last time over here um, is the uncus. Um, so in, you know, an uncle herniation, this can come down and, and compress the, the third nerve right here. Um, I think that's pretty much everything on this picture. SCA, PCA, PCOM, yeah, that's everything. So um, just um, here's the PCA in full, but a brief note before we continue, we would expect to find that fourth nerve origin back here, and that fourth nerve wraps around following the free edge over here where we're higher than it in this image, so we don't see it, but this is the direction it follows. We're also looking up at this picture. Um, so uh, this is uh, third nerve right here. Um, there's second nerve, that's the pituitary stalk. Um, but anyway, this is just to give you an idea of the of PCA territory. So here we see the full PCA. We can see, it, again, it comes off uh, the basal artery, connects with uh, anterior circulation via the posterior communicating artery, and then it turns uh, posteriorly um, around the uh, uh, around the midbrain brainstem. Um, here is the P1 segment, and then we have the P2 segment and the P3 and P4 segments, which supply the cortex. The P1 and P2 segments give off some branches, which supply the thalamus see that in a little more detail. Um, actually, you can see that here. Uh, and uh, yeah, we can, we, we can see P3 and P4 closer here along with their branches, the thalamus and the occipital lobe. The thalamus, and we can see that here. 
as well as giving rise to the posterior choroidal artery. So before we finish up uh, quickly, this is um, a vertebral basilar angiogram. This is what's known as a town view, meaning it's from above and in front. It's showing the vertebral basilar arterial system. Um, and you can quite clearly see the very large aneurysm arising or large aneurysm arising from the bifurcation um, of, of the basilar, of the, I'm sorry, the, the basilar tip right here, a basilar tip. Uh, aneurysm. So let's follow this up from the bottom. Um, so we, here we have our verts, right? So we're looking up and down so we can see the, the length of uh, the SCA and PCA a little bit better. But what would, else would we expect to find around these different levels? Well, first we have the vertebral arteries coming into the dura, coming up. So we would expect the clivus to be around here. Here's our, our, um, our pica coming out. So we can imagine that it's interacting with 9, 10, 11 as they enter the jugular foramen. As we move up, again, vertebral basilar junction in relationship to the clivus. We then have the ica, which comes out and it's forming its loop. So we can also imagine this is about the level of seven, 7 and 8 entering the IAC. As we come up higher, we reach the SCA. So remember, SCA is going to be beneath the tentorium, beneath the third nerve coming around to, to supply that superior surface of the cerebellum. And then as we come up a little bit further, we encounter this big, uh, this big ball, which is in this case a basilar tip aneurysm. And then we can see the, um, the basal artery becoming the, uh, each of the posterior cerebral arteries as they go up and back. And we can see this on a lateral view as well. So, Here's, remember, it's, this is our suboccipital segment coming up of the vert. It's coming up, it's going along that sulcus arteriosus. It's curving around. It's entering the dura. And it's, uh, it's coming up here, here, and now here's where the pica comes out. Remember, here um, uh, comes up, and it, this is that anterior, anterior medullary segment. Um, in this case, the pica, uh, we don't see it fully, or it doesn't take on, you know, it's the most common course, but I don't think we see the more caudal, caudal aspects because we see this area as it comes up underneath the cerebellar hemisphere, it comes around with those cortical branches that comes underneath and around. Um, and then here we have the vertebral basilar junction, forming of the vertebral, uh, I'm sorry, the basilar artery, um, and then we can see we don't really see the SCA as much here, but we see the, and we don't really see the ICA that much either. But we do see the PCA um, as it comes out, and this is where the basilar tip would be. So now, I mean, this image should be pretty clear. You should be able to really uh, navigate this image with these tools with ease um, and use each of the, whether it's bone or soft tissue or dura or nerve or vessel, you can use these as clues to tell you something about the surrounding, right? So we know here's that posterior communicating artery, right? We know if this is the level of third nerve, then we're going to be near that free edge of the tentorium, but underneath it, an SCA should be in our proximity. Um, you know, as we move down, we see the ICA, we know we're going to be around the level of seven and eight, um, and so on. Um, and we can see pretty much, again, everything here from two to three uh, to where four would be, five, six, um, seven, eight, and, and so on. And here's our PCA coming back around. Um, and then this is again, same, same thing, but more lateral view. Here's, you know, here's three, actually let's start from the top. Here's one, two, three, fourth nerve, fifth nerve, Meckel's cave, sixth nerve, Dorello's canal, seven and eight into the IAC, nine, 10, 11 into the jugular foramen, 12 into the hypoglossal canal. Here the, you can see the origin of the pica. Here's that, uh, uh, probably the ica. Um, third nerve going into the octomotor triangle here. Um, second nerve going into the optic canals. This is our anterior communicating artery connecting the right and left ACA going back to the carotid. Remember the carotid is entering the dura here through that distal dural ring, 
coming up forming ACA and the MCA. Um, what else do we see here? Um, we didn't go into the Venus architecture much. Um, we don't really see superior uh, petrosal sinus. This is where we'd expect to find that inferior petrosal sinus. Um, and that's pretty much it. Let's take a look at this. This is a nice video showing a lot of perforators from the BNI. Um, and you can see the, the extent of the perforator network, especially around anterior circulation. So, you know, when you think of vessels, you often think that they're very, you know, if you cut the arachnoid, you can move them around a lot. But in most cases, they're quite adhered um, to uh, the parenchyma uh, with all these perforators. So here again, here's the, the carotid coming up underneath the anterior clinoid process, um, coming up intradural, PCOM, going back to that PCA. Here's the SCA. We'd expect to find third nerve here above the edge of the tent. There's third nerve. There's that posterior clinoid process, which is usually always near third nerve. Here's the cella right here, where we'd find the pituitary. Here's the ophthalmic coming off of the um, carotid going into the optic canal. And from this perspective, we can see the vertebral basilar junction, the basilar artery coming up. And that's pretty much cranial circulation. Um, this I saw recently online, and I thought this was a nice, uh, a nice depiction of the different uh, uh, supply territories of all the different vessels and what to look for in scans. You know, this type of material is very didactic and I think this is actually quite easy to learn, um, you know, through books as opposed to the more uh, three-dimensional anatomy. But I, I, I firmly believe that, uh, as I was saying to Michael earlier, that if you, if you really understand the anatomy at, uh, of all these vessels, this kind of comes uh, a second nature because you as you follow them to their innervation or their supply areas um, and you know their courses, uh, understanding this becomes much, much easier. So uh, questions, any questions on cranial circulation? Um, someone wants to see the thalamus again, uh, briefly, yeah. We can quickly look at that. Oh. There it is. So uh, it's a, in this case, it's quite easy to understand. This is, um, this is a view from superior to inferior. So we're looking from beneath the brain. That's why the pituitary stalk you see here is underneath the chiasm. Um, And uh, sorry, you can I was just reading the questions. You can follow this uh, up here, and you can see, um, you know, the thalamogeniculate artery and the, the posterior choroidal artery, um, as well as all the little perforating branches along the way. Um, which books are good for cerebrovascular anatomy? Yes, um, the book I like the most is, um, let me just pull it up so I don't get the name wrong. Um, yeah, my, the book I like the most, even though it's not directly about anatomy, is Diagnostic Cerebral Angiography by Anne Osborne. Um, you know, especially the older version, it's it very few pictures actually, which is, goes against what I say mostly. Normally, but she describes the anatomy in a very easy way. You can learn the different segments of things and territories of things, and it helps you correlate, um, you know, very visual or surgical anatomy with uh, radiological anatomy as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's one of my favorite books. Um, you know, someone asked about the different segments of the ICA and PICA. Um, you know, there are actually there there are a couple different classifications or, or you know ways to, to call them it's all it's a little it's all very didactic in terms of the pica you know I like the one that we that we described earlier because it really matches the surrounding anatomy um, 
Let's see where that was. Let's see, let me just pull that up quickly. Uh, the book was Diagnostic Cerebral Angiography by Ann Osborne. Um, where's my pica? Ah, here. Okay. So, yeah, uh, segments of the of the pica. I mean, yeah, the ICA has a, has a couple name segments as well, but the practicality of those is, you know, really depending on what you're doing. Um, uh, but the the most important generally is the loop of the ICA, which occurs around seven and eight. For the pica, um, given that it has a lot more involvement uh, in in cerebrovascular disease and surgery, um, it can be a little bit more useful to call it by different names, but its variability does affect the utility of these classifications. Um, but I, you know, we like this one because it really follows the anatomy. Anterior medullary is on the, you know, the anterior portion of the medulla. Then there's the lateral medullary as it, goes, as it curves around laterally. But most importantly is the tonsil medullary segment, because this is where you find that caudal loop. And that caudal loop is important too, because when you incise that dura and you open the dura right there, the caudal loop is going to be right on top. It's going to be between you and the spinal cord, um, and you have to be very careful of it, or if you want to access it, you have to know where it is. Um, and this caudal loop is useful. And then it curves back up, and then it, it comes underneath the hemisphere in the telovelotonsillar segment, and then it curves back down around, and it kind of fans out and supplies you know, from underneath coming around superficial, um, uh, you know, all, all the surface there in its cortical segment. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn this back over to uh, Michael. Hey, everyone. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.